just to remind you of where we're at in the dialogue, um, Socrates had proposed that, that uh, he construct a city to find justice in something larger than the individual soul. And the first attempt that he made at this city was to build a sort of, or describe a sort of um, rural, <coughs> small uh, village where people did work very honestly, um, where they traded with each other um, the goods that they made. There was a division of labor that worked. People were happy. Um, but remember, it was a pretty primitive existence compared to what Glaucon and other people that Socrates is with, ha they wouldn't have um, ever even experienced that. And they were turned off by it. And Glaucon actually said to Socrates, this is a city built for pigs. It's not a city for human beings. It's, it's not good enough. All right, so of course his problem is that it doesn't have the higher civilization, the components of high civilization that he's come to expect and he's used to. Okay? It doesn't have the fine foods, not the entertainment, anything like that. And so Socrates is a little reluctant, but he agrees that he will then, if that's what they want, build a different type of city. Okay? And that's the second attempt. And it's the one that then takes over the rest of, of not the rest, but a lot of, of the rest of this book. Okay? All the details that go into building up this ideal city. But notice that it's not as ideal in some ways. Because unlike the first city, which was really a village, which was um, built kind of organically, you know, people came together, they cooperated with, with each other, there wasn't any initial violence involved or anything like that. In the second city, you start out with some negatives right away. Okay. In fact, he calls it the sick or the feverish city. So it's really not as ideal in a way okay, because of its origins. Okay. So can anybody tell me what's the main thing that has to be done that he points out that has to be done if you don't want to live in a village but you want to live in a larger city with more things, more luxuries, more wealth? Mm -hmm. You're going to need an army. Mm -hmm. Right, you're going to need an army because you've got to have more land. And in the world that they knew, there wasn't a lot of uninhabited territory that was worth anything, okay? And so from his perspective, if, he want, if you want to have a bigger city, you've got to take land from other people. So that means you've got to have a military. And so one of the ironies of this supposedly perfect city is that it is, its origin is an injustice. Okay? Its origin is in taking land that other people own. Okay? Which reflects pretty well the actual situation of Athens. I mean, they grew at the expense of other cities. They were an imperial power. Okay? So that's why you need an army. And also, as you pointed out, you need uh, doctors as well because with the stuff that you get from the empire, um, the additional wealth, and you, you get all the luxuries that these guys want, like a lot more meat to eat and more fatty foods, more alcohol, things like that. So that um, is more likely to make people sick than the sort of real simple diet that they had before. So that's another irony is that the physical well-being of these people actually declines as they enjoy themselves more. Okay. So it may, it hopefully will make you think a little bit about this. And, and another thing that to think about is notice that in the simple city there's really no need for a lot of deep thought because it is simple. Okay. Because people know what's expected of them. And it's really just justice is just fairness amongst them. So there's not a need for a, a, a large government or a lot of laws or anything like that. Okay? Because they pretty much know, you know, I need to work hard, I need to take care of my family, I need to, you know, trade fairly with others so that we don't get into disputes and things like that. So there's not a lot of laws in that first city. But in the second city, um, you get this uh, large government and all this structure. And that's because it's a necessity. 
<clears throat> the more people you have, the more, uh, the more it is necessary. Okay. And with the problems that come with a larger population, you get the need for a philosopher. So that's a third irony. Okay. In the simple city where people are just sort of happy because they maybe don't know any better, they don't need a philosopher because there's not a lot of problems and disputes. Okay? And, but in the larger city where you've got war, where you've got disease, where you're going to get crime, where you're going to get corruption, okay, if, if things are left alone to develop on their own, you need philosophers. You need somebody who can think about these issues. Okay? So philosophy comes into play in the second city with the problems. Okay? And yet, strangely enough, Socrates thinks that philosophy is the highest and greatest pursuit. Okay? So in the healthy city, you can't actually have the highest and greatest pursuit. And it comes at the price of a lot of people not living as well, at least initially. Okay? It's interesting. And yet, when you think about it, um, all great civilizations have been built on taking land from other people, right? That's just a fact. That's a fact of human history. Okay? So he's dealing with reality in, in that sense. Okay? But he's going to take what is first kind of brutal reality, and he's going to try to mold it and transform it into something better through his use of reason. Okay? So because we've got this army we have to have in order to get the land, now we've created a problem for ourselves. Okay? Because what do we have to fear once we put arms in the hands of a, a large number of men? They turn on Absolutely. They're the most powerful um, force in the society. Okay? So they can be the government if they want to be. Okay? They have the power to do it. No one can stand in their way. Right? <clears throat> so it's the number one political problem, how to deal with the fact that you need an army but you don't want the army to take over. You don't want the army to rule. Okay? So that elicits the question, what must, these, what must this new class of warriors be like? And how will we try? They cannot be able to think independently about all issues. Okay? Because if they do, if they get involved in politics, if they think that they are the ones who should think about society's well-being as a whole in all of its aspects, then they will quickly become the decision makers. And then the, the problem with that, of course, is that government will then depend on who runs the army. It may be a good person, but it may not be. So Socrates knows that. It's a very, very dangerous thing that you have to keep under control. So he says the number one quality that the military needs to have is absolute loyalty. Absolute loyalty. And he likens that loyalty to a sort of dog-like loyalty, which is where the phrase the dogs of war come from, I think. It's the idea that like a dog who is always loyal to its master no matter what, okay, so the military has to always be loyal to its leaders and the people, no matter what. Okay? So, of course, this is easier said than done, and there's like a whole lot of this, this book that we're reading now and the next one that's all about how do we train them, how do we educate them, you know, what do we say to them in order to make sure that they stay loyal and that they don't, you know, basically usurp their place. Their quality is their spiritedness, okay? Spiritedness is, well, you'll have to kind of understand it as time goes by, but it's a sort of passion, okay? It involves courage, it involves daring, um, and willpower, okay? The ability to, to, to deal with very difficult situations and persevere, okay? So that spiritedness has to be kind of kept under control, but it's an essential quality these people have to have, too. Okay? So, that implies that there's somebody else, somebody else that's necessary in order to make this work. And it can't just be the common people. Okay? The 
common people aren't going to know how to train and deal with the military. So there's the implication right away that there's another class and it actually turns out to be the philosophers, but at this point he doesn't name them as such. But there's somebody else who's making the decisions about how they're to be trained. Okay? So they become the philosophers. And, they, and by the way, they come out of the military class. So as you'll see as time goes by and he discusses more and more of their training, these are the people who complete the military training with the very best performance and are capable of going even farther okay, into even more education, more intellectual pursuit. Okay? So what kind of things? Did you pick up on anything that they're supposed to be taught or things that they're not supposed to be taught? What kind of education do these people get? Yeah. Go ahead. Isn't this the point where they, he talks about that all the people were born of the earth? That and is a little bit later, but yes, that's, you can go ahead but, and talk about it. Well, it just kind of struck me as kind of like nationalist ideas and the fact that they were all kin, so they couldn't, of course, turn on each other, that they had to protect each other and mm -hmm. their nation as if it was their own family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what we call the noble lie. It's a myth that's taught to everybody in the society, and they are taught, the military are taught, you were born out of the earth just like everybody else in society, so you're all brothers and sisters born of the same mother, and that's supposed to give people a sense of unity, right, and love for their country. And the military is told, you were born with silver in your, in your veins, your body or whatever. You, every class has a medal. There's gold, silver, and bronze. And the silver indicates their role, okay? And they are to fulfill that role to the best of their ability. So the medal is supposed to determine their actions and their behavior so that they won't decide, oh, I should do something else. See, it's supposed to sort of keep them in their place in a way, okay? So, yeah, we'll talk more about that um, uh, when we get to it. That's a little bit further down the road, but absolutely that's one of the things that they're to be taught. But before he gets to the noble lie, he does discuss more generally the type of education that they should get. And it's definitely controlled. You know, when you guys come to the university, you can take any class you want. You can learn about just about anything. Um, and furthermore, in your private lives, you can expose yourself to whatever you want to, you know, whatever music, whatever uh, film, literature, media, whatever. You know, we're, we have a pretty much completely free society here. That's not the type of society that these people are going to grow up in, okay? Now, probably the working class is pretty free. There's no indication that they're not free, okay, to entertain themselves any way they want. But the silver and the gold class, the top two classes, they are trained with some censorship involved. Okay? Um, they can't be told any and all <coughs> stories, for instance, but only those that are good for developing their character. Okay? Are any of you familiar with the Bill Bennett's Book of Virtues, the series? He's written more than one thing. The Book of Virtues is is a book filled with stories that Bennett thought was, were um, beneficial to developing the character of young people. There's other books like that out there, but the idea is that you, you, you tell them these stories that have morals, okay, and therefore they learn and they develop their character in a certain way. You don't expose especially young people to the more sordid side of life or to any and all choices now, when they're older in our society, we de definitely think they ought to be able to make their own choices. But when they're young, a lot of us think you need to restrict those choices. Mm -hmm. Was this the part of the book where he talked about the balance that the warrior class had to do? They had to have the balance of appreciating life through philosophy and things like that, but they also had to be skilled in the art of war. Yes, yes, it's, it's in and around this area. They get exposed to both the, the education that's, that's uh, necessary for warriors, which involves the development of their, you know, the physical side as well as their spiritedness and the, you know, the skills that they need. But they also get exposed to the philosophy as well, to discussing and, and, and thinking, because out of this class is gonna come some of the philosopher leaders. 
So you have to know which ones of them are capable of advancing intellectually beyond the warrior class. So yes, they get exposed to both. And even the ones who stay in the warrior class, um, they, you know, it's, it, some people have asked, can this really happen or could you possibly do it? Because they're fairly thinking people. They're pretty highly educated people. And yet at the same time, they're supposed to be absolutely loyal. Okay? And so people ask, well, how can you, you know, how can you educate people at that high a level and still ask them to not think when it comes to whether they should obey? Okay? But he has to do that because otherwise where would the leadership come from? All right, so they get some stories, but not all. Like they probably wouldn't be exposed to sordid, you know, romance plays, uh, or they might not ever hear about some of the shenanigans the Greek gods um, are said to have committed. Um, and even goes into music. They cannot be exposed to music that's too highly exciting. Okay. Um, he believes that there are certain rhythms and certain modalities in music that uh, excite the lower passions <coughs> and uh, people should not be exposed to them, especially when they're young. They need to listen to music that brings out the calmness and uh, the intellectual side, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, it's kind of like you know, I don't know what you think about this, but kind of like encouraging your young son or daughter to listen to classical music instead of, I don't know, rap, maybe, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but he, he spends a lot of time on that. So obviously he's very much a person who thinks that what goes in is what comes out when it comes to education. What you fill a person's head with is it determines their character, okay? Does anybody want to dispute that? That's a fairly, actually kind of a controversial uh, thing to say, isn't it? That first of all, that we should con control the content to this extent, especially with people who may end up being leaders. And secondly, that it really does determine our character to a large extent. Anybody have any argument against that? I agree. Okay, you agree with it? Yeah? What goes in comes out? So for us in a free society, we've got to do that for ourselves. If we're going to, if we, if we think this way, then we've got to have enough self-control to actually censor ourselves in a way, to not, to not listen or to any and all things, not to view any and all things and so forth. And that's difficult. It's difficult because you, you have to impose it on yourself. Whereas in this society, it's not as difficult because these decisions are being made for these people. But if they came to find out that they were being that censored, do you think that would cause problems? Problem. I mean, it could. It could. You know, it would depend on how thoroughgoing this is and how early they start and so forth. But um, some folks in debating this have wondered, you know, um, would not they find out what they're missing? Isn't there some way that they would know what they're not being exposed to at some point? And might they not feel like they were overly manipulated? Okay. Um, but then again, is there any other way to obtain this level of control unless you, uh, in effect, raise them like, um, like you're training dogs? So these are just some questions that this section of the book raises. Um, sounds like most of you, does any, anybody disagree with this, that it's important for children to only be exposed to certain themes and ideas? Okay, that's probably not very controversial, most of us. I mean, when you become parents, if you're not a parent already, you'll realize it's kind of, you know, almost, well, not almost, it is instinctual. You just don't want your kid to be exposed to things that they can't even understand and that may mess them up, so you, you're pretty careful about that. What about this? I know some of you expressed that, yes, even as you mature, it's still important to carefully, you know, carefully watch what you put in. Does anybody want to dispute that? Uh -huh. uh, I think as you get older, it's important to read more and understand more so you can better make decisions. I mean, you have to understand what the opposite 
is and what your opposition, how your opposition thinks so you can follow some the military side coming out so you can better uh, contradict them and better um, counteract them. Uh-huh, yeah. Couldn't you argue that if you really know what you think and you're kind of squared away as far as your character, that it isn't necessarily any danger to you to be exposed to contrary ideas at that point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I was thinking just uh, kind of the opposite side, like just taking, let's just say, certain rap songs. Like, I mean, I know what a lot of them say about how they think about women. But, like, I don't want to, I don't necessarily need to listen to that over and over again to know, like, that I think it's ridiculous. It's like, like I think if, I think when you listen to things over and over again or watch them, I think they are on your mind. And I think, it, I think it does affect you, even if you don't, even if you're 100% contrary, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, like, I think I should be really careful and, yeah. It's interesting, you know, I mean, the, I guess the way I've thought of this is that it's not so much that somehow these ideas are going to seep in as much as if I give too much time to this, which is not too good for people, then I'm giving less time to this, which would be better for me. It's, it's a matter of, you know, the, the time and every, everything that you do takes away time from other things you could be doing, right? So if you're spending all day long um, listening to that kind of music or um, or watching whatever, you know, on, uh, on your cable TV, it might be taking away from other things that you could be doing that might make it better. Uh, did I see anything else? Yeah. I think it's uh, just as important when you hit maturity to uh, see the immoral, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just as important to see the moral, almost like you'd see a two-sided debate. Mm -hmm. um, and if you never see the immoral, your biases would uh, definitely gleam when you ever or question with adversity. Right, yeah. yeah, you've got to know, that's kind of your point too, you've got to know the opposition, you've got to understand how other people think in order to be able to handle uh, your own position well, right, and to be able to defend it. Um, but maybe you have to be a pretty f on pretty firm ground before you do that, so that you're not um, swayed or pushed off of your own position. I don't know. It's an interesting question. Um, I think a lot of us as adults, we think that once we do have our point of view down, that we're not in much danger um, uh, from being exposed to other, other material. Um, and I guess I tend to agree with that. Um, but but uh, it is a, it's a good question to ask ourselves. And Finally, and probably most controversially, is there any role that government should play in shaping these choices for both children and adults, or do you think government should stay <coughs> out of it? You're, you're pretty adamant, no, they shouldn't be involved. Yeah, I'm a libertarian, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. I think uh, the government shouldn't, but there's only a few rare cases where it should. For instance, when the, uh, when the security of the state is at risk, like in the World Wars, the government censored, you know, uh, they weren't propaganda films, but just the news films and stuff. That way, you know, because I think at least in World War II, our security was most at, at in danger. <clears throat> Only in those cases, though, should the government really cultivate a, a really unified front at home. Mm -hmm. But when we aren't being threatened, I think it's very dangerous for the government to be able to do that. Okay, so only in extreme cases where our national security might actually be at risk, but not just people's characters. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I mean, most of us would would be pretty troubled by government shaping um, our choices, especially as adults. Um, we do have some obscenity laws. They're pretty much, I mean, because of the new media, they're pretty much not really working at this point anyway though, so there's there's a, a lot of freedom. Um, there used to be less, a lot less in, in this area, you know, I mean, before there was even cable TV, you know. Um, uh, the government had a lot of control over what appeared on TV and what couldn't appear on TV, and it had a lot of cooperation, as I understand it, from the, from the uh, people in Hollywood too. <laughs> um, but as time gone, has gone by, even those regulations still exist, but, but, but they haven't been applied to the new media, so you know, we pretty much got around them. Um, we have ratings, but we can use those ratings in any way we want to, right? So um, from what I can tell, the biggest concern for us has to be with children, 
um, if people are concerned about this at all, it's, it's should children be exposed and how do we prevent children from being overexposed to, to the wrong type of material, but not how adults should be. So the reason why I raise these questions is because the worldview of, of Plato is really so different in this area than ours. That there's a big contrast here, you know. For him now, you know, the Republic is kind of an extreme statement of the idea that government should shape our characters, that that's its number one <coughs> job, really. But throughout all of the dialogues, there's this assumption that that's the business of government. The government isn't just to sort of make us safe from each other, um, and to give us uh, certain laws so that we can do business with each other, it's a lot more than that. You know, it's supposed to shape us to be good citizens and to be good people. Whereas, as you know, for, for us today, we view government very differently, and that's based on the philosophy that the founders themselves embraced, the, the, the liberal philosophy that says, you know, we make government for certain basic things. You know, namely, mainly the law enforcement, you know, to keep the peace, all right? Uh, and maybe a little bit more to help um, uh, smooth the way for commerce by enforcing contracts, for instance. Maybe providing a postal service or something like that, but it's not supposed to get involved in how we're educated even. It's not supposed to get involved in, you know, what kind of things we, we watch or read or listen to or anything like that because it's none of their business. It's a private matter. And the assumption for us is we develop our character in our family, in a private family, and then also in our smaller community, the people around us and maybe sometimes in our church or synagogue or someplace like that because we choose to go there freely of our own free will, but we don't have to, okay? Until, you know, that period of time in the Enlightenment uh, period, which is what influenced our founders, the ancient view was much more prevalent in the sense that, you know, throughout most of European history, for instance, the battle was over whose church would be you know, the established church, but the assumption was there had to be an established church because you needed that to you know, tell people how to live their lives, you know, what to believe about God, what to believe about morality, and uh, you know, the laws apply to your moral behavior as well as everything else. So, so Plato's way of thinking is not as strange as it first appears it's just that we have changed, but for a lot of human history, the assumption's been more like his. You know? Government should be involved in, in people's lives to this extent because they can't be left to make those choices on their own. Too many people will make mistakes. But uh, of course, the problem with that is then we fight over who's going to decide how we should live our lives. You know, It's not that our founders thought that that wasn't an important question or that there wasn't an answer to it. The problem was they knew that we would kill each other over it. And that's why they stepped out of it. Okay. Not because there isn't an answer to it. All right, so these are some of the other things that they should learn, the warrior class, that the gods are just. So this would be a very different rendition of the religion. Okay, The gods are always just and they expect humans to be just. And there should be the idea that if you're good and you've done what you're supposed to do, you don't have to fear death because you will be rewarded in the next life. Okay? On the other hand, if you've done evil, then you will, be, you will not be rewarded, you'll be punished. Okay? But the assumption is these people will do well and they will do their duty and they'll be rewarded so they don't have to fear. Now, why is this particularly important to teach them that the next life is not a frightening place? So we don't fear death. Right. They, they have to be as fearless as possible to be warriors, right? So um, if they're afraid of dying, that's obviously uh, going to get in the way. Um, also, they have to be taught that it is virtuous to be tough, you know, that it is um, that we look down upon uh, people who are too, too used to their luxuries, okay? too soft. So we look up to those who don't need them and can go without them. 
all right? Because when it comes right down to it, there's going to be lots of times when they aren't going to have those luxuries, even though they're supplying them, they're making it possible for other people to have those luxuries. They themselves may have to do without them, and they have to be very tough, okay? Now, is there a concern on the part of Socrates whether these teachings are true or false? Is he, does he care whether he's lying to people? Are these lies? <coughs> well, you know, some people really, you know, I think you, in the video, Joyce Carol Oates is one um, who reacts really strongly to this whole section. She thinks it's like, uh, you know, totalitarian communism practically. It's just terrible. They're telling people every move to make and, and they're, you know, not letting them think for themselves at all. And they're telling them lies. But uh, that's not the way Socrates looks at this. Again, it's not, not making excuses for him, but that isn't the way Socrates looks at this. The way he looks at it is they've been told lies before. You know, when they watch the nasty romance drama or the, um, you know, learn about the gods cavorting with humans and killing people just because they're, they've made a bet with some other god or whatever, okay? Those are lies, okay? What he is going to teach them reflects the truth, for instance. What a rational person could possibly believe about the gods, for instance, okay? Um, what a rational person would think about love, okay? So I think the way he looks at it is he wants poetry, music, theater, literature, religion, all of those things to reflect the philosophic truth rather than the falsehoods that human beings create to entertain themselves. Does that make sense? So, I mean, one of the reasons why Jews and Christians were, were uh, both attracted to, and actually Muslims as well, were all attracted to Platonic and then Aristotelian philosophy is because of this very theme that there is a truth that can be discovered, okay, in their case through reason, that doesn't reflect what human beings have sort of built up over time, okay? and that there's one God, as a matter of fact, uh, which sometimes Socrates <coughs> asserted, or at least if there's more than one God, that the gods are just and good by nature, and they're better than human beings, and they're a standard for human beings to follow. So of course, monotheistic religions were attracted to this philosophy. It reflected their basic view about what God is like, that God is good, that God is a standard bearer, that you know, by following God's personality or God's teachings, you become better. Okay? So that's the way he would look at it. Now, that requires somebody to be smart enough to figure out the truth about things so that they can rewrite the stories about the gods, so that they can rewrite the play, so to speak offer entertainment that reflects the truth, okay? But that's, that, that would be his defense, and that would be his defense of the so-called noble lie, that the noble lie reflects the actual truth better than a lot of other beliefs that people have built up. It's a sort of truth hidden within a story, um, the particulars of which are not true, such as being born out of the earth, but the larger picture, the larger message is true. All right, now in the warrior class, Socrates discourages <coughs> excessive sexuality, you might say. Now this is a little bit difficult to figure out, I guess, exactly what's going on here. And I think I mentioned last time that, that Greek culture had a different view of, of homosexuality and, ho and particularly relations between Young and young and old, older men than we do now. Okay, um, we're not talking about regular relationships between two men. We're talking about what we would call pederasty. Okay, 
And uh, so uh, it's difficult for us to understand what's going on here. But uh, he says down, just to read the crucial passage, he says down at the bottom here, 79, it seems then that you'll lay it down as a law in the city. We're establishing that if a lover can persuade a boy to let him, then he may kiss him, be with him, and touch him as a father would a son for the sake of what is fine and beautiful, but turning to other things, his association with one he cares about must never seem to go any further than this. Otherwise, he will be reproached as untrained in music and poetry and lacking in appreciation for what is fine and beautiful. So he's addressing there the common practice uh, of men who had some status and money in this society to find a young boy, maybe like around 12 or 13 years old, to kind of become their mentor. And in the process of becoming their mentor, they, they would have a sexual relationship with the boy as well. And it was sort of a trade-off. The young man would be mentored, he'd be supported, he'd be, he'd be able to sort of find his place in society, but the price would be of having this type of relationship, okay? Socrates himself did not participate in that behavior, okay? He had a young man by the name of Alcibiades who loved him very much, who actually pursued him, um, but Socrates drew the line at a sexual relationship. So from his point of view, to have friendships between two men, even if one was older and the other was younger, was fine okay, and beautiful, actually, and a sort of mentoring type of, of situation. But to have a sexual relationship was somehow wrong. Okay? It went too far because the other party, the younger party, would not choose that if it was their choice. Okay, So it's an interesting situation and he appeared to think that that engaging in that type of activity brought both people down that it somehow damaged the character of both people and it was better to keep that relationship on a higher plane okay? but he was really bucking unfortunately a real um, strong um, system okay and you'll find that some of his friends, like Glaucon thinks, as he states later on about the warrior class, okay, these people have to have some, you know, rewards for what they do. Shouldn't they have the very finest pick of the young men, okay? So it's a, he's bucking a real strong institution. And he's basically saying, that's not why you develop these relationships. You develop them because of friendship, because of the exchange of ideas and so forth. Okay. In general, Socrates thinks that too much thinking about sex produces too little thinking about other things. Okay, but this particular institution is something he had a problem with in particular. Okay. So I believe that is where we get the term platonic love. Oh, well, it won't work, but you know what I mean. What, what do we think of as platonic love today? When somebody has a platonic relationship, have you heard that term? Mm -hmm. A non-sexual relationship. Right, it's a, it's a non-sexual relationship that is close, all right? So um, that's where that comes from, right? And that's what he strove for. Um, so it's a different type of love. All right, so Obviously, the answer to this question is it's important to keep them away from those distractions which bring them down into the lower, you know, the lower pursuits or the lower passions. It draws them away from what's more important in his view, which is that higher friendship, that higher love that is born out of actually, you know, knowing each other's minds and discussing. And the other dimension of this that I'll just mention is that this whole discussion reflects the Greek position that love between man and woman was inferior to love or friendship between two men. And that was because women were not at this time raised to be the equals of men, intellectually uh, or physically, obviously. Uh, so um, they were oftentimes loved and prized for what they thought they were 
okay, managers of the household, mothers of their children, and so forth. But when they sought to have friendship, they did not look to their wives. Okay, so this was part of it. All right. So, because the soul is not just rational, but spirited, we have to watch that that spiritedness is not warped towards um, the over-sexuality or in any other way. All right. So, again, because of the need for the strict education and control, we need a wiser class. And this class will come from the guardians or soldiers, okay? And they will have the best, like you said, a balance of both the best physical attributes, but also of wisdom. So you begin to see a sort of um, pretty strict selection process, all right? That's, that's way more strict than, you know, how some of the European countries have systems where if you don't pass a test when you're in fifth grade, you can't go to college, supposedly, right? They track people really early on. And here in this country, we think, oh my gosh, what a shame. You know, lots of people aren't at their best when they're in fifth grade. How can you determine that? But there would have to be a lot of judging, a lot of constant testing, you know, to see which one of these guys would emerge from um, this warrior class and actually gain entrance into the ruling class. And as I just use the term guys, but as we'll see pretty soon, he does surprise his uh, friends by proposing, and we'll talk about this next week, but proposing that women be in these top two classes, that women train to be warriors, that women therefore would be eligible to be the philosopher rulers too. I'm just now doing some research on that issue, and there's a lot of different opinions about what's going on there, so we'll talk about them. But um, So we have these three classes, the rulers, the warriors, and the workers. And I like to think of this as a pyramid because, of course, the, the, the class in which there's the fewest number is the ruling class. Okay? He doesn't specify a number, but it's got to be small, the people who are qualified. The next uh, largest is the warrior class, and then we have this large group, the workers. And from what we can tell, they live fairly freely. Okay? The warriors are the police force, too, and they make sure, I'm sure, that there's no crime and so forth. But they don't have the restrictions on themselves that these top two classes do. And as we'll see, these top two classes live in really extreme communism whereas the bottom class, the large working class, does not. Okay. So we'll have to talk about why it is that, um, that we have to give up all of our things, why we, why we can't have private property. As a matter of fact, we can't even have uh, families, because that's a form of private property in a way. Okay. So let's look a little bit more closely before we go at this myth that you reference the noble lie. I'll just kind of look at the elements of it, because it serves a lot of purposes. This is what they'll be taught. This is, a, as a matter of fact, what everybody is taught. He says, <clears throat> I'll first try to persuade the rulers and the soldiers and the rest of the city that the upbringing and education we gave them and the experiences that went with them were a sort of dream, that they in fact themselves and their weapons and the other craftsmen's tools were at that time really being fashioned and nurtured inside the earth. And that when the work was completed, the earth, who is their mother, delivered all of them up into the world. Therefore, if anyone attacks the land in which they live, they must plan on its behalf and defend it as it was their mother and nurse, and think of the other citizens as their earthborn brothers. Okay. Arnhart makes mention that though this may sound a little bizarre at first, it's not that far off from the way that we ourselves think about our founding, in a way, in this country, and the idea that we're all children of either God or the nature that um, 
that our founders also referenced that we're somehow <coughs> equal as human beings. You know, either either because of the religious argument or the natural law argument that we're all equal as human beings, equal dignity, we deserve equal respect, and that we're brothers and sisters. So, I mean, we aren't, we aren't taught that we spring out of the earth like mushrooms, but we do have some notions about who we are as American citizens, you know. So, this is the equality part. Okay, this is the part that says, you know, you're equal and there's a great deal of unity because of that. We all share the same mother. All right? Now, here's the second part. All of you in the city are brothers, we'll say to them, but the God who made you mixed some gold into those who are adequately equipped to rule because they are the most valuable. He puts silver into those who are auxiliaries, and iron and bronze into the farmers and other craftsmen. For the most part, you will produce children like yourselves, but because you are all related, a silver child will occasionally be born from a golden parent and vice versa, and all the others from each other. So the first and most important command from the God to the rulers is that there is nothing, and notice, the God to the rulers, okay? There is nothing that they must guard better or watch more carefully than the mixture of the metals in the souls of the next generation. If an offspring of theirs should be found to have a mixture of iron or bronze, they must not pity him in any way, but give him the rank appropriate to his nature and drive him out to join the craftsmen and farmers. But if an offspring of these people is found to have a mixture of gold or silver, they will honor him and take him up to join the guardians or the auxiliaries. For there is an oracle which says that the city will be ruined if it ever has an iron or bronze guardian. Okay. So what does that add to this story? What does that tell people? That they, they, they have these metals, but sometimes uh, two bronze parents, for instance, produce a silver child, or silver parents produce a golden children, or the golden, children, golden parents sometimes produce a bronze or a silver child. It's not uh, inherited through like blood or I guess genes, which we know now. It's more of like the gods just uh, give you certain abilities. Uh -huh. I don't even view it as like different, like one's higher than the other. They're all the same. I just feel like the gold just will just give them more abilities, but they're actually all equal. Right. The, the metals show them what their role is, what their role is. So each one has a role determined by that metal, supposedly. Okay which I think is designed to help them to accept that they have that role. But, and that we'll find out that he thinks that the biggest problem in such a city would be if somebody from one class meddled in the affairs of another class. Like if somebody who's bronze thinks that they should be involved in governing, or somebody who's in the silver class thinks they should be involved in governing. Then you have turmoil, okay? Um, so you've got the, the roles. You've also, though, got uh, this idea of merit determining what role. So even though they're taught that they have these metals within them that determine their role, they may not be in the right class. So there's an element of flexibility here. They have to be looked upon. They have to be tested. They have to be basically judged by their abilities. Okay? So some people react to this myth by saying, oh, it's like the Indian caste system practically. It's really oppressive. And maybe it would be in practice, but we do have to keep in mind he's, he is leaving open the possibility of movement between these classes, but it has to be based upon actual abilities. Okay. 